for, first of all, this was one of the better performances I've seen from Joe Biden in quite a while. I mean, yeah. he he, um, he had a pretty clear message here. He had a clear message. I think he was he he looked alive to, to mm. use to use that phrase. You're listening to Macro Sunday, hosted by Andreas Dino. Happy Sunday, everyone, and welcome to the Macro Sunday podcast. I'm Andreas Steno, founder and CEO of Steno Research. And as per usual, I'm joined by my friend and partner here at the company, Mikkel Rosenwald. Welcome to you. Thanks a lot. You're our head of geopolitics, and um, we obviously have plenty to discuss from the geopolitical scene over the past week as well with um, new messages from China, um, Joe Biden's State of the Union speech, and a lot more um, in roughly... 15 minutes time we're joined by joseph wang also known as the fed guy uh, since we have interesting discussions ongoing on the federal reserve balance sheet uh, and it is probably more likely that they take some decisions on the balance sheet than on the fed funds rate at the march meeting just before we went uh, on air here recording um a new story broke from reuters uh basically hinting that the Bank of Japan will hike interest rates uh, at the March meeting. We've been banging the drum on an April hike for a while, but uh, this seems to be one month ahead of schedule. Um, and <laughs> I guess the world is truly upside down when Japan is thinking about hiking interest rates, Miguel. But it may be at least partially related to what's ongoing in China. Uh, we've obviously seen the Chinese economy struggling for a couple of years, Mikkel, and yeah. this week the authorities had more than one chance to actually say something new, both to the market, but also, of course, to internal stakeholders in China. You watched the um, the communication from Li Qiang, I think his name is. Um, so please fill us in. Who is Li Qiang and why do we need to listen to uh, to the new messages? So he is more or less Xi Jinping's uh, right-hand man, yeah. uh, 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 very critical figure in the Chinese government, potential uh, heir to him as well. Um, so basically his, his speech is, uh, is usually one of the most important in the, at this uh, uh, National People's Congress in China. Uh, he lays out the, the, the growth targets for the Chinese yeah. government, uh, indicates at future policy ideas and directions for the Chinese government, so that that's always one to watch. Um, it's a very stark contrast to uh, to, to watching U.S. politicians. Uh, <laughs> very little showmanship, uh, very subtle remarks that you have to read a lot more into than what yeah. they're actually say saying. Exactly the opposite of watching a State of the Union speak uh, uh, speech with people shouting at each other and, and all that. <laughs> so very very different uh, uh, experience. Very very interesting contrast. Anyway. The Mi Chinese, yeah, yeah Miguel, The main takeaways from that speech, I yeah. mean, you you wrote uh, an article to our clients. I think it was on Tuesday, right? Yeah. With the three main takeaways from this. Yes. So, how how important are these three takeaways? I think the growth target is, is interesting because uh, China basically realized a uh, growth of, of about five percent last last year. That's obviously year on year. So that's compared to twenty twenty two when people were being uh, sheltered or held, <laughs> held held inside their apartment complex complexes even though they were on fire. I mean, 2022 was a, was a heavy lockdown year for China. So a growth from that to 2023 was to be expected. The growth from 23 to 24 is, is, is still, the, the growth target is still 5%. That's obviously a bit more uh, ambitious and that's it's relatively realistic when we look at our forecasts and forecasts yeah. out there. So this seems to me like a target that the Chinese can reach, but which is still ambitious enough to satisfy the, the, uh, the population in China, uh, essentially. Um, this also hints at increased stimulus from the the the, the Chinese government. We had a, a lot of remarks on that. The the central government is going to, tr to try and, and and strengthen the 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 consumer class within China. We had some remarks on the real estate sector. Um, Xi Jinping's government is going to try and and save s uh, certain key projects to keep their hand on to 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 avoid a complete collapse, basically of of, of real estate, especially because so many Chinese have almost their entire fortune uh, invested in real estate because it 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 can be complex for individual Chinese to invest in uh, uh, in, in stocks and bonds and similar. So so the real estate sector is a, is is very critical for the for the for the upcoming middle class of the Chinese economy, and that that's a major focus. 
So aside from that, I think we are, uh, politically speaking, entering sort of a new era uh, uh, in China, especially when it comes to the, the the dynamic between the central government and the local governments and state co- state-owned corporations. Because we've been used to a lot of the um, a lot of the 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 debt buildup in China has been in local governments and state-run uh, corporations. I think the central government is going to take a larger role in this, a more direct role in managing the economy and driving consumer confidence to higher levels, which is going to be the new driving force of the Chinese economy. Uh, one thing I kind of lacked and many investors lacked was uh, initiatives to create more security and transparency for uh, international investors going into China. That is still a major issue for China. They are uh, they are finding it sometimes hard to attract the level of foreign investment that they would like because the the political process is so uh, so muddy and opaque. Uh, and that is an ongoing concern, I think, for the Chinese. Um, Li Chiang tried to remedy this a little bit later later in the week, but 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 that was still the one big lack, in my opinion, from from this Congress. Yeah, and and it at least partially dates back that discussion to. Mm. Um, Pardon my friends, the middle finger they gave to international investors in the Evergrande case. Exactly. Um, dollar bonds uh, were made more or less, uh, <laughs> well, without value, basically. And yeah. um, I guess they've struggled with the international investment community ever since. <laughs> and and I did just a piece of anecdotal evidence here, Mikkel. I, um, I went to New York uh, yeah, a couple of months ago. And I gave a presentation at an investor community, uh, and I I knew that it was <laughs> kind of a contrarian take to put on on the front page. But I just wrote, "The cheapest assets on earth are found in China," <laughs> and they almost asked me to leave the room as soon as I sh- showed that front page. And I mean, it was obviously a front page designed to create a discussion or a debate. Rather, um, I'm not sure I'm particularly keen on, on buying mainland China assets myself. Uh, but in any case, it seems like the market is is leaning into this story positively right now, yeah. Um, yeah. also via various proxies. Yeah, and it makes sense. I mean, one one to, to one simple way of summing up this conference or the, the messaging was that China is going to increase their federal deficit or their government deficit uh, from 3 to 3.5%, three which is a lot of money. Um, that's only partially going to the military. Uh, only small portions of that are going to increase military budget. It's not really going towards building empty houses around the place or, or, mm. or new highways. It's going to the middle class. It's going to the Chinese consumer. So the Chinese consumer is, in my opinion, a, a very solid bet for the for, for the entirety of twenty four. Yeah, and we've we've seen early signs of Chinese consumption proxies rebounding. Exactly. One example of it is the uh, South Korean uh, trade surplus. South Korea is a major trade partner to China, um, especially within uh, semiconductors, and what we've seen is. Um, quite the improving trend in semiconductor exports to China, uh, probably also via proxy countries. Um, South Korea has performed decently well uh, on the exchanges over the past month or so. We've seen copper moving out of range uh, lately. And also the Australian dollar is is, uh, certainly celebrating this slightly better sentiment out of China. Uh, so to me, this is kind of emphasizing what we've been talking about for uh, at least a month or so, this pro-cyclical market rotation that is ongoing. Um, we've uh, studied the value gaps relative to the business cycle across uh, emerging Asia over the past week. Uh, it's safe to say that Korea looks very cheap relative to this. Uh, but if you want to to uh, have a look at the entire study across Asia, uh, you can find that on our webpage, stenoresearch.com, where we um, lay forward our fair value uh, assessments uh, based on um, on data. Miguel, you mentioned uh, <laughs> uh, Chinese politics being a different beast to US politics. Uh, and typically, we have a Trump soundbite of the week uh, in this show. But I think given that uh, Joe Biden held his State of the Union speech over the past week. It is timely to to play a soundbite with Joe Biden instead this week. So let's listen to Joe um, and his uh, State of the Union speech here. Madam Vice President, members of Congress, my fellow Americans, in January 1941, Franklin Roosevelt came to this chamber to speak to the nation 
and he said, I address you at a moment unprecedented in the history of the Union. Hitler was on the march. War was raging in Europe. President Roosevelt's purpose was to wake up Congress and alert the American people that this was no ordinary time. Freedom and democracy were under assault in the world. Tonight, I come to this same chamber to address the nation. Now, it's we who face an unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, my purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is that freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas at the very same time. <clears throat> overseas, Putin of Russia is on the march, invading Ukraine and sowing chaos throughout Europe and beyond. If anybody in this room thinks Putin will stop at Ukraine, I assure you he will not. <laughs> and um, Michael, first of all, this was one of the better performances I've seen from Joe Biden in quite a while. I mean, yeah. he, he, um, he had a pretty clear message here. He had a clear message. I think he was he, he looked alive to, to, use, to use that phrase. Uh, he, he engaged in back and forth with some of the Republican uh, uh, audience uh, who were yelling at him. Uh, he was sharp. He was he had a good tempo in his speech. Uh, uh, from purely uh, a performance standpoint, uh, uh, he looked really really good. I think. Uh, uh, and this was of course a kickoff to the presidential campaign. Now that uh, Nikki Haley has dropped out, Trump has won the nomination. Uh, this was the beginning uh, of the general election campaign that's good it's uh, uh, probably the earliest we've had of those mm. it's going to last until november and this was uh, sort of a kickstart of that um so yeah he, he put great energy into this i think a lot of the uh, uh the mockery of him and all that fell a little bit down uh or it was was yeah was it was hard for people to laugh at, at, at this performance of yeah. Biden, even though a lot of people were prepared for that. He, he did well. Politically speaking, uh, he laid out some uh, some policies. I mean, he, he spent most of the uh, of his speech uh, attacking Donald Trump, uh, mainly on the on, on Ukraine, but also on uh, on the immigration issue. Uh, we know that Donald Trump has pushed a lot of Republican uh, uh, congressmen to 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 avoid passing a, an immigration uh, deal. Um, in order for Trump to use this as a political weapon against uh, against Biden, he played a lot of that. I think that message is resonating well with voters. So they're playing a lot on that, that Trump is basically uh, sacrificing the border issue for political gains. Financially speaking, we didn't hear too much. There were a lot of talks of, uh, of tax reform. I don't know how many of our listeners is going to be hit by the potential billionaire's tax, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but that, 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 that was a part of it. That's going to be a big part of his campaign as well. Um, so yeah, not too many new policies. Um, that's not really what we see from these uh, U.S. political leaders. It, 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 it's all about format and, and appearance, but, but, but we did have some. Overall, uh, yeah, really interesting to get this campaign started. Yeah. And uh, Michael, I think the day before the State of the Union speech, uh, Jay Powell um, testified in front of, uh, of Congress as well. Uh, and Jay Powell kind of sounded stuck on repeat uh, from his last press conference, uh, which is interesting to me. I mean, given Biden's focus still on spending, um, I, th I think that's safe to say that that his uh, overall policy is still one of spending. Yeah, um, spend. Jay Powell keeps repeating that there is a scope for low interest rates in the US. Um, the timing has been postponed, sure, but the bias or the tilt is still damn clear. They don't want to bring rates higher from here. Uh, and they seem almost hell-bent at getting interest rates a little bit lower. Um, given what we see with the pro-cyclicality in markets, um, improving business sentiment, improving uh, signs of consumption out of China, etc., um, it seems like central banks, and I basically think the message from the European Central Bank rhymed with that as well, that they they will lean back and allow the market to reflate here, um, which is kind of positive news for right about everyone invested, right? It is, um, it is, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, markets have basically cheered on on this message 
for weeks. And um, yeah, it looks like a melt up more or less. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's where we headed. So Mikkel, um, given Powell's signal sent to Congress, also on the balance sheet, uh, I think it's time to um, introduce a true subject matter expert to the Macro Sunday podcast. Joseph Wang um, is a former trader at the Open uh, uh, Markets Desk at New York Fed. Um, he's clearly an, a former insider within the Federal Reserve System, um, and no one's better than him at actually unpacking uh, the balance sheet developments um, from the Federal Reserve. So um, without further ado, let's introduce Joseph to the Macro Sunday podcast. And as per usual, uh, we introduce our guest of the week with a bit of intro music. Um, and I've found an interesting YouTube clip <laughs> with, I think, Johnny Cash um, lamenting the role of the Federal Reserve in the Federal Reserve song. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Joseph Wang to the Macro Sunday podcast. Joseph is also known as the Fit Guy, and you can check out his work at fitguy.com. Joseph, thank you for joining us. Hey, Andreas, great to see you again. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure, Joseph, and uh, you're one of the absolute best watchers of the Federal Reserve out there. Um, you have a background at the open market trading desk, so you obviously know the system from within. And Joseph, we have a lot of focus on the Fed balance sheet at the moment. Um, during the early innings of the year, we've seen several members of the committee talking about a tapering of QT. And it seems like it's linked to this overnight reverse repo facility. So please fill us in on why this overnight reverse repo facility is so important for the tapering discussion. So as you note, Andreas, right now, everyone is focused on the upcoming potential taper of quantitative tightening. So just for some background, over the past uh, year or so, the Fed has been gradually shrinking its balance sheet. Now, as we're approaching the beginning of the rate cut cycle, the Fed is looking forward and thinking of slowing down the rate that it's shrinking its balance sheet. That is to say, tapering QT. Now, there's been a lot of focus on this, but not a lot of concrete discussion. So we've heard a wide range of views from Fed speakers on when they want to taper QT. Uh, there's a few ways of thinking about this. So there's some people who think that we should begin to taper QT when the reverse repo balance gets to zero. The, the logic there is that if you have a lot of money in the reverse repo facility, then you are clearly, clearly in, a, in a regime where uh, there's a huge amounts of liquidity. And so it's okay if you can taper QT at a fast rate. But when the RRP goes to zero, some of the Fed speakers are thinking that, you know, we're, we're not as sure uh, where, how abundant liquidity is in the system. So we should just kind of slow down our pace of QT a little bit and proceed from there. And there are other Fed speakers who are just looking at the overall total RP plus bank reserves and thinking that, well, we, that number is still huge. You add it together, you're, it's close to $4 trillion. So they don't see a reason to, to slow down anytime soon. Now, what we know, though, is that at this upcoming March Fed meeting, they're going to have a big discussion on how to proceed with QT, let's say when to taper and when to finally end it. So we'll definitely know more in the coming weeks. But right now, uh, this discussion is, I think, pretty broad. So, Joseph, um, it's an interesting interesting discussion, um, this one on how to actually measure whether liquidity is abundant or not in the dollar system. So we've obviously seen it over the past five, six years, these instances where repo markets suddenly blow up because of a lack of uh, dollar liquidity. So how do you actually measure whether liquidity is abundant or not? Do you need to track private repo markets or how do you do it? So. There's a, there's a few ways to look at this. Now, 
Now, before we go into t- any discussion on liquidity, well, uh, let's be clear, liquidity, it's kind of, it's a word that means different things to different people. Now, since we're on the balance sheet discussion, I'll take it to mean just how many, how much reserves uh, that the banking system needs to function. And that's certainly what the Fed cares about uh, when they are doing QT. The Fed wants to shrink the balance sheet so that the, this, there's basically just a little bit more uh, reserves than the system needs to function. Now. There's a few ways to do this. One is you can go from a very high level view and just say, you know, let's say I need 10%, uh, let's say the reserve levels should be about 10% of nominal GDP. Uh, that's a very high level view. Another way to do it is you could actually ask a whole bunch of banks, survey them, ask them just how many reserves do you need? Uh, just to be clear, reserves are just deposits at the Fed. Uh, so if you and me, we have money, we place it on deposit at a commercial bank, but if you're a bank and you have money, you place it on deposit at the Fed. The whole discussion is about how much cash does the banking system need. So another way to do this is to just survey. And the third way to do this is, Andreas, as you suggested, we should just look at market rates. For example, let's look at the spread between um, various money market rates and the reverse repo facility offering rate. Now, in September of 2019, we saw repo rates spike enormously uh, for a couple of days. And the common interpretation that the Fed uh, had when they were looking at this was that they were thinking that, oh, this must mean that there's not enough cash in the banking system. We overdid QT, and that's why these overnight money market rates are spiking. And so that's one of the indicators they also look at. Recently, we had one Fed speaker noted that because money market rates, say repo, say Fed funds, are still below interest on reserves, that indicates that they are uh, quite far from in a a situation where the banking system doesn't have enough cash. So at the moment, just looking at these three things, let's say reserves levels as a percentage of GDP or money market rates, it it does seem like there's more than enough reserves in in the banking system to function uh, which is why QT is still going at full speed. Mm. And Joseph, ahead of this uh, March meeting, a couple of the members have obviously tied this discussion on QT tapering to the level of the overnight reverse repo facility. Uh, by the time of recording, we're still above 400 billion in that overnight reverse repo facility. So there's still some room to the downside before we get to that zero point. When we look at bank reserves, it seems like markets tend to celebrate if money moves from this overnight repo, uh, repo facility into the banking system instead. Do you think there is a link between these balance sheet discussions and how asset markets fare, or is that um, link something that is created in the minds of investors? That's a great question. Mm. So when I was at the Fed, we would have discussions with a whole range of hedge funds and investors and so forth. And a surprising number of them would just kind of show you a chart. See, you know, reserves up, asset prices up. So easy, right? (laughs) (laughs) And there seems to be a lot of people who base their investment strategy on this. So there's definitely for sure a psychological connection there in the minds of investors. Um, Internally, I I think the Fed was always skeptical of this link. So they they weren't sure why this would be the case. Now, to be clear, the Fed has also very, been very candid and admitted that they don't really understand how the balance sheet, all this stuff works, which is part of the reason why they would like to get back to using the overnight rate as their primary policy tool. So I think there's undeniably um, a link in the minds of investors uh, of relationship between reserve levels and, and um, asset prices. And it looks like our reserve levels have gone going up, and so asset prices have been going up as well. Now, going forward, my expectation is that the that the RRP would probably approach zero sometime in the middle of the year, let's say around June. A big reason that the RRP has declined over the past few months uh, has been the increase in bill issuance, net bill issuance, and the increase in private repo. Now, in this uh, coming months, there's a seasonal cash uh, issue with the Treasury whereas that we have a lot of cash inflows because of its uh, April, March tax date. So in the US, people pay taxes, individuals pay taxes in April. 
And that means that Treasury gets a huge inflow of cash and they have less need to issue bills. And so net bill issuance is going to decline in the coming months. So there, that's, I think, a good reason why the drain in the reverse repo facility is going to slow. And Joseph, this discussion on T-bills is also one that is very present within the committee. Um, we've seen Chris Waller, uh, one of the members of the committee, referring directly to the increased bill issuance from the U.S. Treasury over the past 12, 18 months. And um, he brought forward a discussion on whether the Federal Reserve should try and match that to a larger extent in their holdings of uh, of Treasury assets. So this discussion on a potential twist towards buying more bills and fewer coupons, how do you think that will uh, interact with this discussion on QT tapering? So Governor Waller, as you noted, made this speech, I think, last week. And it was it was really interesting because now the Fed, it's the first discussion of what the balance sheet will, would look like after QT. So Governor Waller is looking forward, let's say, two years from now and trying to have a vision as to what the Fed's balance sheet will look like. And he's saying that historically, the Fed held about, say, 30% of its treasuries in bills. Today, it holds less than 5% in bills. So the Fed's balance sheet has been uh, heavy on coupons, so longer duration treasuries. And the purpose of this change over the past decade was because they implemented quantitative easing and they were trying to buy a lot of longer dated treasuries to put downward pressure on interest rates. Now, he seems to want to reverse that going forward. I think this is really interesting because, in effect, this lengthens the impact of quantitative tightening. So, even after, so when the Fed finally ends their quantitative tightening, they're basically going to be they still have a portfolio of treasuries. It's just that they're not shrinking that portfolio anymore. If they want to change the composition of their treasury portfolio at that time, what they would be doing is that when they receive repayments of, uh, of the treasury securities that they currently hold, they're going to take that money and reinvest, reinvest that into bills. In a sense, they're still allowing their coupon holdings to fall off and taking and replacing them with treasury bills. So in a sense, it's very much a continuation of the effects of QT, uh, increasing the amount of duration the private sector has to hold. So that that's going to have a, well, that should put upward pressure on longer dated interest rates and steepen the curve. And as you suggested, Andreas, somewhat of a twist effect. Now, to be clear, though, this is something that's happening maybe two years from now, and we've only heard Governor Waller talk about it. Governor Waller is a very influential person on the FOMC, but he's not the only person. Yesterday, Chair Powell, at his Senate hearings, uh, seemed to give some degree of support to this idea that it's worth talking about. But again, we're two years away from where this could actually happen, so we definitely want to pay attention to it, but not place too much weight on it just yet. Joseph, when we look at the yield curve, um, it's obviously been inverted, and uh, we've had plenty of discussions on whether this yield curve inversion signal is sort of an early warning signal for the economic business cycle. Um, given that the Federal Reserve bought a lot more coupons relative to uh, the weight of coupons in the actual issuance from the U.S. Treasury, I've seen a couple of pundits floating the idea that the Federal Reserve manipulated the yield curve into inversion because of their larger influence longer out the curve. What's your take on that discussion? Do you actually think that they have impacted the curvature of the curve uh, with this larger uh, impact in the longer end? Oh, absolutely. That's the whole point of quantitative easing, right? You're trying to manipulate the curve. Listen, the Fed holds, what, $4 trillion worth of treasury securities. You buy $4 trillion worth of anything, you're going to impact its price. No <laughs> question about it. So, <laughs> so yeah, absolutely, they're manipulating it. And I think that's part of the reason why they want to, um, you know, they, they want to twist a little bit. Maybe they're getting the sense that, whoa, inflation is high, economy is booming, but the long dated treasuries still seem, you know, kind of low. So the, the rates seem kind of low. Maybe they're thinking that they're having too much of an impact on, uh, on yields and trying to 
let the market play a bigger role. Joseph, um, another technicality surrounding this potential twist operation uh, suggested by Chris Waller is that the Federal Reserve ran a regime of negative cash flows in the, in 2023 because of a mismatch of, of assets and liabilities. Uh, it's obviously not a major issue um, as a central bank. You, you're obviously in charge of, uh, of the money, uh, so to speak. But it seems like Chris Waller also noted that buying more bills would allow the Treasury, uh, sorry, the Federal Reserve to have a better balance between asset and liabilities. How important is this mismatch of assets and liabilities for the Federal Reserve? Yeah, as you as you correctly note, right now the Fed has negative operating income. So it has a large portfolio of longer dated assets that it bought when interest rates were very low. And it has liabilities that are basically overnight. So the, the Fed pays interest on reserves and interest on the reverse repo facility. Right now, as the Fed has raised rates, uh, short rates are let's say five and a half percent, but the interest income on their asset portfolio is still really low. So um, year to date, well, actually, no, cumulatively, since, since the beginning of all this, the Fed has had a negative operating income that's accumulating about $160 billion. And that doesn't have any impact on how monetary policy is conducted. As you note, Andreas, the Fed can print money, so it doesn't really matter. But politically, it does look pretty awkward to have a central bank that's losing uh, over $100 billion. Of dollars. Mm. Now, to be clear, over the past decade, since the beginning of quantitative easing, the Fed has been a huge profit center for the federal government. Cumulatively, uh, in the uh, post-GFC era, era, when interest rates were low, the Fed has earned over $1 trillion U.S. dollars. Um, but of course, people forget about that and just focus on their operating loss today. And one way to reduce the operating loss going forward is to make sure that your assets are more in line with your liabilities. So if you have more bills, shorted dated assets, then when interest rates rise, or your asset income will also rise, so you have less operating losses. That also, of course, means that you have less operating income going forward if we ever go to a world where interest rates are very low again. Joseph, you've been uh, banging the drum. Uh, I've noted that on the story that the U.S. economy um, has been accelerating, um, and I think, um, hands down, you've been one of uh, the pundits with with uh, out with this story very early. Uh, so, so kudos to you on on that. It seems like the <laughs> the the overall narrative is slowly but surely catching up to your uh, view that the U.S. economy was was actually faring better than than feared by many. How do you read these, the current economic cycle in relation to monetary policy? We've obviously seen a, uh, a repricing of the very front end through the uh, early innings of the year. Uh, and it seems like Powell is sort of postponing the, f the first rate cut slowly but surely a little bit here. How do you read the situation right now? Is it even feasible to talk about rate cuts? Oh, absolutely. So the first thing to first thing about Fed washing is to listen what the Fed says. And Fed speakers... All of them are telling you that they're going to cut rates sometime this year. And as you suggest, it's been being pushed uh, forward into the future because the economy has been doing better than expected. Um, but Fed speakers are still pretty sure that it's coming sometime this year. The way the Fed looks at this is that they look at the world through the lens of real interest rates, which is nominal minus expected inflation. Now, inflation has been coming down. Inflation expectations have been coming down. And so just to, just to not over tighten, you're going to have to cut rates a little bit. Now, that being said, this framework is most likely nonsense. Uh, as we see, equity markets buoyant, credit spreads quite narrow, economy continues to grow above trend. It's pretty obvious that monetary policy is really just not that tight, although the Fed thinks it's very tight. And that difference, I think, is where there might be opportunity going forward. But in any case, yes, the Fed uh, seems quite determined to cut rates sometime this year. In December, their dot plot guided towards three rate cuts. And in a couple of weeks at the March meeting, we'll have an update on that dot plot. I suspect it's still around three cuts. And um, the final question I have for you, Joseph, relates to uh, the longer run expectations for 
the Fed funds rate in this dot plot. Uh, I guess it's one of the key discussions ahead of the March meeting, whether some of the members could be tempted to increase their assessment of the long run um, Fed funds rate in this dot plot. How important do you find this dot plot and the guidance on long run equilibrium rates to be for markets and uh, and the overall sentiment? And what what are your expectations around what Fed members will decide to do here? So the way that the Fed tries to figure out whether or not their stance of policy is tight or not is that they have this idea called the neutral rate. So the neutral rate, let's look at it in real terms. So if you have an monetary, if you have interest rates above the neutral rate, the Fed thinks that you are being restrictive, you are slowing the economy down. And if you have interest rates below the neutral rate, the Fed thinks that you're easing and you are um, trying to you're positive for economic growth. So right now, now over the past few years, the Fed has thought that the neutral rate is about 0.5% real. Now, if you look at it from this perspective, right now, real rates are a little bit below 2%. And so from this perspective, monetary policy is very restrictive. And that's why all the Fed officials are telling you that monetary policy is restrictive. But what we've also noticed over the past few years quarters is that it seems like there's some small, small drift where some more people on the in the Fed are thinking that, you know, maybe a neutral rate is a little bit above 0.5%. Now, this upward move is very small and seems to be um, a minority view. Hmm. But if that were to be gained steam, uh, that would mean that they began, the Fed is beginning to realize that their policy is actually not as tight as they thought it was, and that would argue for, let's say, interest rates to say around a higher level than before, uh, higher level than certainly before the low interest rate era. So maybe I would. My own expectation is that if when we start cutting rates, I think the end of the cutting cycle would probably be around four uh, percent, definitely not zero percent. Uh, because I think that the neutral rate really has gone up. And uh, we saw how Loretta Mester um, mentioned the possibility of hiking this long-term uh, assessment of the Fed funds rate uh, over the course of the past week. Joseph Wang, also known as the Fed guy, it was such a pleasure hosting you at Macro Sunday and uh, we'll certainly invite you back later this year for an assessment of everything that's ongoing within the Fed. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Andreas. We're uh, back in the studio from uh, the discussions with Joseph Wang. Uh, always a pleasure to host Joseph. I've had um, the uh, opportunity to talk to Joseph several times over the years, and um, he seems like um, a great guy and uh, obviously very knowledgeable in these trends on the balance sheet. If we look at the state of the union seen from our perspective in the US, Mikkel, um still seems like we're on path towards a big fiscal deficit, uh, maybe even a bigger deficit than last year. Uh, that's at least uh, the early trends that we've seen in 2024. And given Biden's State of the Union paired with what Powell said in Congress, Mikkel, um, it seems like a pretty decent bet that the U.S. economy will be allowed to accelerate from here. Absolutely. I think mm. so. I think so throughout 2024. Uh, uh, I think that's uh, all the key actors are working towards that end, basically. There, the, the, there's no uh, scope for, for, for any sort of uh, uh, break up or, uh, uh, yeah, slamming the brakes on this. Not in any way. So I think that's that's a decent base case. And, and as we've been discussing over the past weeks, we should rather look to uh, the rings in the water to the rest of the world. Yeah. Yeah, we mentioned the, the Chinese GDP target of 5%. If you look at the uh, economic consensus right now, we're probably at around 45 to 4.6 yeah. in the economic consensus for China. Um, so there is actually a bit of upside uh, to be seen in China if they deliver. Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. And, and, and I mean, that's uh, it's both driven by, by expectations for, for, for how much the U.S. consumers are going to, to, to basically demand of, 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 of the Chinese production uh, uh, set up and then of course as we mentioned it's going to be driven or, or further further uh, uh, empowered by by chinese government spending mm. i think that's another factor into this that the the chinese consumer is going to 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 grow in importance and that uh, that could add even more fuel to the fire even within 24 yeah uh and <laughs> 
given how we've rotated our portfolio over the past uh, month or so, um, we obviously like what we see out of China right now. I have to admit that we've tilted into South Korea, we've tilted into copper, we've tilted into silver. Um, so some of the trades thriving in a pro-cyclical repricing of the global economy. Um, the big question here is whether interest rates can drop anywhere on globe yeah. given this environment. Uh, and here I'm talking about five to 10 year interest rates. Um, of course, the front end could uh, could drop if we get those rate high, uh, sorry, rate cuts from uh, that we've always almost been promised by, by various central banks. Um, but it seems like this growing pro-cyclicality will, will impact the cur curve further out. Um, yeah. Based on the discussion I had with Joseph on on the potential twist of the operations from the Federal Reserve, that adds another layer of potential steepening to the yield curve in the U.S. So we're also positioned uh, uh, for for such a move in um, in the dollar yield curve. The European Central Bank and the European political picture is a bit different to this. Uh, let me let me uh, put it like that. So far, the European Central Bank doved up their projections quite remarkably this week. Um, they are close to admitting that they will reach the target on inflation in 25. Um, the next thing for them to admit is that they will reach it in 24. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think they will get to that conclusion by June, uh, meaning that they will cut rates. But if we look at the fiscal side of the equation in Europe, we don't really see as firm size signs of, for example, the German no, politicians no. allowing for bit bigger bigger fiscal deficits, Michael? No, no, I mean, the, the European politicians are, are, are a bit more conservative when it comes to this. Mm -hmm. The main outlay we're, we're seeing discussed right now is uh, is into weapons, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and we are seeing the EU trying to put together a, a, or reestablish the uh, the what we used to call the, 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 the convergence criteria of, of, of Maximum limits to, to 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 government deficits, uh, which was in place before the pandemic, which yeah. is technically still in place, but 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 not really enforced. Yeah. So 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 we are seeing a, a Europe a returning to this Angela Merkel uh, auto liberalism. You could yes. almost say. I mean, basically, uh, don't spend any more than you have. Don't uh, stimulate the economy in any way. Uh, mm. Yeah, uh, check all the boxes. And uh, I think it was the week uh, before this. The German politicians allowed for a headline saying now billions will reach uh, the real economy from fiscal stimulus. But if you calculate uh, this stimulus package as a percent of GDP, we're talking less than 0.1%. Yeah. And that's, for example, compared to the 0.5% of, of GDP that we're exactly. talking about for China. Exactly. So it seems like Europe is sort of if, if you will, behind the curve on, the, on this topic relative to China and the US. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and What's even worse than that, as I mentioned, a, a lot of this increased government spending is going to weapons. Mm -hmm. And yes, weapons, uh, of course, you increase the demand for weapons, so it gets counted into the GDP, but a lot of these weapons and ammunition are getting blown up in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really fuel the broader economy in that no. sense uh, as much as investments into other areas. That's not to say that it's a stupid idea, but but I mean, strictly uh, from 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 a stimulus standpoint, it's it's absolutely not the best way to stimulate long-term growth in an economy. So so no, uh, currently Europe is focused on other, on other things. Mm -hmm. Europe is focused on Ukraine on the climate crisis, the upcoming uh, European election, and obviously the immigration question. So, so, so no, there, are, there is no, uh, no, 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 no sense of urgency to this uh, uh, in Europe. So, the economic consensus has moved towards repricing the U.S. growth outlook positively. From a sequential perspective, I think the next story could be to reprice China a little bit positively. Yeah. That's also where where things are headed in markets, mm -hmm. I think, um, and that leaves some pretty decent risk rewards in China proxies out there. Uh, I mentioned copper and South Korea. Yeah. Uh, while we're still kind of lacking the confirmation that Europe will try to catch up to this narrative of fiscal spending. Um, and therefore, we we don't really see the need to, to enter pro-cyclical trades in Europe yet. No. Uh, we've, we've entered them via Asian proxies instead. Um, and if you want to track our portfolio developments, um, if you want to see the trades that we've added over the past weeks, then uh, you need to go to stenoresearch.com where we run these portfolios live and in a transparent way for, for clients of ours. Um, yeah, the cyclical rotation continues uh, and um, it seems like China decided to play ball with our views over the past week, Miguel. Absolutely. I think uh, we will leave it at that. Uh, remember that you can get a 14th day's free trial at stenoresearch.com. We'll put the link uh, to our 
uh, subscription page in the show notes. Uh, we also have a free newsletter for those of you who want to get uh, some free nuggets here and there uh, from our research team. Uh, you can also sign up on the link that we've added in the show notes. Mikkel Rosenwald, always a pleasure to host you. Yeah, and remember out there, when we talk about trade ideas, um, we need the best disclaimer in the world <laughs> to disclaim that we're not always right. So here is Gennaro Katsuzo with a disclaimer on our trade ideas. And sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. <laughs> Thank you, Dinaro, and uh, thank you to all of you listening and watching to the show week in and week out. Um, we'll be back again next Sunday with more. Bye.